Hey there, it's great to have you all. My name is Malta, I'm the, the founder of Airfocus and I'm also gonna be the moderator today for this uh, amazing conversation with Adam Grieco. Um, we are gonna wait a bit for more people to tune in. Um, so give it another one or two minutes, please. All right, more ready, people ready to go, ready to go. Yeah, more people joining uh, this webinar. So welcome to Top PM Voices, episode number four. My name is Malta. I'm the founder of Airfocus. I'm the world's most flexible product management platform. Yeah, I'm a product guy, but um, uh, I also love data. And our topic today is data and product teams and who better to guide us through, through this conversation than a true luminary in, in the analytics industry. Our guest today is none other than Adam Grieco, the field CTO of Amplitude, a product that we all uh, love and use. Uh, he's a really esteemed analytics industry veteran. He's the author of the Adobe Site Catalyst Handbook and Insider's Guide. Uh, and yeah, he's a, like, a real expert in I would say data-driven decision-making, both in product and marketing. Um, and I had the privilege of meeting Alan um, at the Berlin Product Conference uh, 2022, where he had a talk on uh, an introduction to the future of product and marketing analytics. And right during his presentation, uh, I was so fascinated. I immediately shot him uh, a LinkedIn connection request and um, said, we need to have this guy on. And yeah, sometimes in life stuff takes a bit, uh, a bit of time. And uh, now one and a half years later, we, we finally have him on. So it's, it's great to have you. But before we dive into uh, this conversation, uh, I would like to extend an invitation to our upcoming episodes of Top PM Voices. We have some really incredible speakers lined up with um, amazing content to share. And Ala, um, the moderator who's in the background here, will be sharing the, the link with you in the, in the chat box shortly. So, and additionally, we uh, encourage you to uh, participate in the discussion. Uh, if you have questions, ideas, or thoughts, just drop them in the, in the chat box, uh, and we'll be sure to, to bring them uh, on stage um, later. So now, without further ado, let me hand over the stage to our uh, amazing guest, Adam. Welcome, Adam. Um, Thank you. So maybe, much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Could you maybe please take a moment to introduce yourself to, to our audience? Yeah. It's nice to meet everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Adam Greco. Uh, I'm currently a product evangelist slash field CTO here at Amplitude. Um, as, as Mother mentioned, I've been in the analytics industry for way too long. I had a full head of hair when I started this uh, probably about 25 years ago. I used to run websites and try to figure out why I had a website and what our website did. And in the early days found a, a new technology called web analytics, where we would you know, use data to figure out what people are doing on a website. And then over the last 20 years, have just kind of seen that evolve. I worked for uh, one of the leading uh, digital analytics vendors. I also managed uh, data and analytics uh, for salesforce.com worldwide, which was really cool and have been through thousands of digital analytics implementations. 
And a couple of years ago, I joined Amplitude to kind of dive into product analytics because of some of the things that we're going to talk about, just some of the convergence of marketing analytics and product analytics. So the last two and a half years has been a crash course for me on product teams and how they use data a little bit differently than traditional uh, digital marketers, which is where I came from. Amazing. Thanks for the, the intro. Before I start with the first question, um, we have a question for the audience. So here's a poll coming up um, where we encourage everyone to kind of uh, give us their opinions. So what role do data-driven strategies play in your product management processes? So ranging from super essential, oh good, I like that already, to um, it's not it's not for all products. <laughs> so let's wait for the for the results to come in. So um, we ran the same question on our LinkedIn community, and the results were that sixty nine percent of the people that responded said. Uh, and analytics is super essential for decisions, uh, but that also means that 17% of them said they mostly rely on their guts. And I'd be curious to see how this, this kind of data changes uh, with a much smaller sample size today, uh, people still coming in. So Ala, what, what does the data say? Okay, oh, wow. So the small sample size still confirms a little bit that um, product analytics is still an emerging topic um, and companies and product managers still trying to, to figure out how they can make more data-driven decisions. So that's um, interesting on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's perfect because we have a, a lot of interesting topics around this, this whole, whole thing, yeah? So um, perfect, I, I'm very excited. Um, Adam, how did you get into the data world? You, you already touched upon this a bit, uh, but I, I would like to double click a bit more into yeah. uh, in, into your um, career. Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's a, a website or a mobile app, I think that I've always been kind of a data person in my personal life. Uh, I actually, when I was really young, started doing budgeting to try to figure out where I was spending my money. And I've, I was a finance major in college way back when. And I just always kind of gravitated towards numbers because I felt like numbers tell you what's really happening. Um, I also love Microsoft Excel, big Excel guru. I actually did programming in Excel, my first job out of college. But I think when I think about how much work people put in to build a digital product, you oftentimes want to understand if that work is paying off and why you're doing it, what the benefits are. And I think there's both a qualitative and quantitative way to find that out. And I think that the data has become, what, what's become essential about data is that, especially through COVID um, and, and the way that things have happened in the last couple of years, when, when I was young, most interactions would happen with humans. You know, you would go to a store and you would buy something. But now we're in just a whole new world where you don't get to actually talk to customers that much in person, depending on your business model. And so much is happening online or through website or through apps. And I really look at data as a way to listen to customers. I think it's the new way to listen to customers. And I think what hasn't changed over the last couple, you know, hundred years is that the companies that do the best job of listening to their customers tend to do better because they get better feedback. They have more growth loops. And if the only way that you have to listen to your customer is through say data, and surveys or you know some sort of you know feedback loop that is a little more qualitative i think you got to focus on that because we just can't read faces anymore and we can't talk as much in person and don't get me wrong i'm all for talking to customers as much as possible but it's just the world we're in now is such a digital world and so that's kind of how i got into data is i ran a website and i couldn't get anyone in my company to tell me why we had a website they just knew we needed to have a website and I yep. use data as a way to figure out 
what were people doing? And I actually went back to my the the board and said, hey, I did some analysis. And just so you know, this is why or what people are doing on the website. And it was completely different than what the board thought that the website was there for. And that was kind of my epiphany why data is really important. Love this. So much wisdom already in, in this uh, little uh, intro. So you touched upon this a bit earlier already, but um, how have you seen product teams use and think about data? Maybe also um, how they think about data uh, differently than, than marketers. Yeah, so there's lots of different groups that I've met who are product teams and some of them love data some of them hate data. And so I think there's a wide spectrum. I think that the, the best product teams I've seen are ones that don't become kind of um, owned or slaves to the data, but they use the data in combination with other inputs that they get in order to get feedback and build better products. And so um, a perfect example of this is when I first joined Amplitude, there was a particular feature of the product that uh, we didn't have that I had used in other analytics products that I thought was really important. And I went to the product team and the product team said, we're tracking how people are using our product and we don't see any indication that we need that feature. And they're looking at all the features that are being used. They said, we talk to customers all the time that's never come up. Uh, we do surveys and we never hear about that feature. But I basically did the worst thing for someone like me to do is to say, trust me, you know, don't don't listen to the data. Like, <laughs> trust me, because I, I know what I know about this. And so I, I used every political leverage I can do to get them to do an alpha kind of MVP of the feature that I thought we needed. And it really took off. And then we moved it to a beta. And that feature is now the third most used feature wow. in the Amplitude product. And so I bring up that example not to say how awesome I am, but um, I think what's interesting about that is sometimes you can be so, um, like the data can become like almost like blinders and it can prevent you from actually using your gut, which I think you should use your gut sometimes, but if you use your gut, you can then validate that with the data. So if our product team believed me and built this feature and no one really was using it, then they would have been able to kill it off quickly and say, Adam, we told you so. But the data actually was the arbiter of whether we should pursue it further or not. And so I just see the data teams, um, the, the, the good ones are really saying, we want to look at the quantitative, the qualitative. If we roll out a new feature and no one's using it, now we've got to decide, is it because it's not helpful or is it that they're not exposed to it? So then maybe they expose more people to the feature through, say, feature flagging, A-B testing. And if it still isn't being used, then the data is telling them either get rid of that feature or maybe don't invest further in that feature. But I'm also a big fan of uh, the company 37 Signals slash Basecamp. Uh, yep. I, they're, I'm, I live in Chicago. They're, uh, they're headquartered in Chicago and they're a huge Chicago success story. And if you read a lot of their blog posts, a lot of times they're saying, you know what, don't look at the data, like do yep. what you think is right. And I think depending on the size of your company and your culture, there's certain there's pros and cons of each. But I think more often than not, product teams are using the data to figure out what they should be building or to validate what they have built if it's the right thing. But I also don't think you should ever stop trusting your gut in some cases and then following that up with data, if that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. So coming back, um, this is so interesting. Um, and it's so interesting also that you that you, uh, that you you point out uh, 37 signals now because it's like really at the very end of the, the data-driven spectrum. I, I, I listened to a podcast where they, the CEO pretty much said like, we're, we're working on stuff that we like to work on. That's it. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, yeah, you got to... Gotta and I didn't, I didn't answer your second question really quickly. You mentioned about how yep. it's different from marketers. So coming from a marketing background, I will tell you 
that a digital marketer, a lot of their job is to find new customers, acquire people. Yep. And that is a super data driven process because you're buying Google keywords, display ads. You have to see how they're doing. You've got to see the performance, looking at the attribution. So I think marketers were kind of ahead of product teams when it came to data because marketing, especially digital marketing has always been so data driven. That's the reason why um, like for example, Google analytics became to be because um, you know Google was basically like, we're gonna buy Urchin, which was an analytics product and give it away to free for free to all of our customers so that they can see how impactful their Google keywords are because otherwise they're gonna stop buying Google keywords. So because of that whole cycle, uh, marketing has always been really data driven, but I still think there's room for creativity because you might want to do an A-B test on two different copy on two different landing pages and see what performs better. But I think uh, marketers have always, even going back to the email days, marketers would send five different versions of emails with five different subject lines. And they're just really, they were born for many years to be very data driven. And I think product teams uh, maybe came a little later because I think they were a little more creative and they want to build like, hey, this is, we know what we need to build kind of like the 37 Signals folks. Yeah. So um, you have written about product and marketing teams converging. Why do you think this will happen? And what will it look like in, in the long run when they're converging? <laughs> Yeah, so there's a couple reasons why this is happening. So there's a technology reason because many businesses are going digital through digital transformation, as I mentioned earlier, but also there's a website. And nowadays, it seems like every company has a mobile app. Uh, that's just the way it is. Or some companies like uh, Uber, like they only have a mobile app. Like that's really all they do. So I think one problem that we've seen is that marketing has always kind of run the website. Some people even refer to it as the marketing website. So I'm sure that you have a website and you're trying to get people to come to it to learn about your products. And that's usually run by the marketing team. And they might use like a marketing analytics tool, like a Google analytics or an Adobe analytics, from my background. But then once they actually download the app and start using your product, or if your product really is an app that just happens to be served in the browser and they authenticate and they log in, a lot of times that's when the product team will take over and they'll say, hey, we're here to collect data to figure out how they're using the app. And I was shocked for many years that the marketing people who were responsible for communicating what the product does and getting people to the website to get them to either fill out a form or start trialing the product through PLG, they didn't talk to the product team. And the minute that someone started using the product, totally different North Star metric, total, totally different data. And I think because people are jumping from web to app, consumers, if it's a B2C, they want to have the same experience. If any of your users, uh, anyone who's on right now thinks about Slack, most people use Slack through an app. But you could log into a website and use Slack and the interface is 99.9%, .9 if not 100%, exactly the same. And so that's a good example of kind of how you, two platforms merge. But all of you probably had experiences where you maybe go to an e-commerce site on the website, you put stuff in your cart, and then you then you then if you have a mobile app for them, you log in and it doesn't have the product. And it's like that mobile app has never heard of you before, never seen you before. <laughs> and yeah. what ends up happening is a bad experience. And that's because the marketing department and the product department sit in two different groups. A funny real world story. When I worked at Salesforce, I was in charge of marketing analytics, driving people to our website. The minute they filled out a form and became a free trial for 30 days, I had no visibility. I wasn't yeah. able to see any of that. That was the product team. And there were a lot of downsides of that because the product team didn't know how we found them, didn't know which product they were interested in. We just shoved them into whichever product we wanted, which was usually sales. And the marketing team never understood what they were doing in the free trial. You know, which features really resonated with people that they could use in advertising. And if they stopped using the free trial after like a week, the product team didn't really know that. I mean, they knew that in mass, but they didn't know it down to the individual level. But if they would have communicated that back to the marketing team, we could have spammed them and got them back into the free trial and, you know, got them further along in the journey. And if they ended up buying the product, it was really difficult for us in marketing to connect the acquisition that we did 
to the downstream product success of them becoming a customer after the free trial. And all of this is because we've sat in two different departments. And so a couple of years ago, I just decided this has to stop. We have to figure out a way that everyone is using one platform, one data set, marketing and product, view the world from the customer's perspective, not from their organizational perspective, and have one holistic experience and one big customer journey, even if they call the call center or if they go to a store, if there's a physical location, all of that needs to come in. And that's kind of why I joined Amplitude, because I wanted to take product analytics and then bring in my expertise of marketing analytics and build like a super product. But I think that's what the trend is. And customers' expectations of digital experiences just get higher and higher every year. And they expect every brand to really know them and personalize them. And you can't do that unless marketing and product converge. Okay, this is um, such a logical argument. And yeah, I think we've all seen uh, Google Analytics completely uh, break um, uh, in the middle of the user journey. And it's it's a very frustrating um, experience. So um, we are a product management company. This is a, a, a product management um, uh, webinar series. So let's move a little bit to the to the product teams. I'm super interested to to hear your view on what mistakes uh, you think product teams make when it comes to data? Yeah, I think that when I work with product teams, I don't think that they oftentimes go deep enough into understanding the core journeys or funnels that their users are going through. You know, for example, one of our most popular reports in our product is that conversion funnel where you can say people do step one, they step two, step three. But I think that a lot of times they'll say, okay, we're losing 40% of people from step one to step two. And then we lose another 30% from step two to step three. But I find that a lot of product teams don't dig into why that is happening. And in my opinion, there's a couple different ways to do that. One of them is to do qualitative research and to kind of ask people, why are you not doing these things? Um, the other thing is something like we just added to our product for this very reason is we just added session replay, the ability to replay so you can watch someone going between different steps so that you can visually see what they're going through to see if maybe something jumps out at you, why they're not making it through. But there's so much information in why people are not making it between different steps. And I think that too often I see product teams that keep ranking out features all the time, but they don't realize that the features that they have today aren't actually being used. And I think everyone who's listening right now probably can sympathize with this is that you might have 50 features in your product and then you've got a backlog <laughs> of all the features that they're using, you know, air focus to say, we need this, we need this. But how do you figure out how to get people to use what they already have better? And I find that product teams look at the data reactively. Like, yeah, okay, I could see how often this was done, this was done. But I think there's a different proactive approach that they should take. And an analogy I use a lot is the difference between the thermostat and the thermometer. And a thermometer is just a tool that helps record data to tell you what the temperature is today. You can see what the temperature was last week. And I think that's what a lot of product teams do. But a thermostat is still around temperature, but it allows you to turn the dial left and right. And I think that if you are only using data to report on what's happening, instead of using data to say, we're gonna come up with hypotheses about why they're not using this feature. We're gonna try something different. We're gonna either communicate or tweak the feature in some way and then see if that has a positive impact. Then you can get more people using what you have today or get rid of stuff if it's not useful and make your app easier to use. But I, I'm always shocked how often product teams are what I call thermometer product teams when it comes to data instead of thermostat. And if they're really honest with me, a lot of times they'll admit that probably five to 10% of the time they're looking at data, they're actually using the data to do really cool new hypotheses and trying things and then following up to see if the data showed that they were right or wrong. And about 90% of the time, they're just kind of reporting to people what's happening and not coming up with those ahas or those insights that they can then take action on. And that just really frustrates me um, because there's so much information hidden in that data. You just got to find a way to mine it 
if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And like, I, I'm so guilty of, of, of many of these things, to be honest. Um, so how do you balance intuition and data in, in making product decisions, especially in like scenarios where they, they might point in, in opposite directions? So, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think what you've got to do is, um, you know, we work with a lot of companies and we wrote a really cool document about kind of building your North Star metric. And I think understanding what it is that you're really trying to get people to do is super challenging. But I think that if you can spend enough time really understanding that, then you can start at the end goal that you want and work your way back backwards and figure out what is your problem from the end goal to the step right before it. And that's where you're going to get your most value and then work back and back until you've got a really good cycle at the, at the core, then it's hard. I see too many people who start way, way up front and not closer to where they actually derive value. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was joking with some folks at Amplitude, you know, we're a digital analytics platform. And I was talking to someone internally, I said, what do we sell here at Amplitude? And a lot of people came back with, well, we sell, you know, the best digital slash product analytics platform on the market. And I was saying, no, I don't agree with that. I think we sell insights. I think that is the product that we sell. That we happen to have a tool that makes it, that hopefully makes it really easy for people to collect data, run reports, analyze that data and come up with those insights. And every feature that we're building hopefully is helping our customers come up with aha moments or insights. And insights then lead to value because once you learn something new, you can change things and you can make your product better. And so now how do you turn insights into a North Star metric? that's a little bit tricky. And so a lot of times we have to use like leading indicators or things that are proxies for insights. But I think and for everyone who's on this call, like you have to think about what is your metric that you really care about? And then how are you performing with that metric? And what if you go one step back from someone doing that, whether that's revenue or filling out a form, whatever it is, go one step back and optimize that. And then once you optimize the heck out of that and you think there's nothing more you can optimize, then go one step back, one step back. Like that's how I've seen people get a lot of value. And I think marketers get frustrated with this because they just want to throw money at the problem. They want to just, let's just get more people, buy more keywords. But I think you're basically have the classic leaky bucket situation where you're basically spending all this money to get people who are going to fall through. They may not be your right ICP. They may not actually get to your final North Star metric because you haven't optimized your, your loops. Okay. Fascinating. You touched a few times on, on the North Star metric. Could you share a bit more? And um, if you can share also, uh, what's the North Star metric of, of, of amplitude? Love to know. Yeah. Yeah. So in general, you know, and I'm not as much of a product expert as some of the you know, you're all your folks here, but you know, I've been through a couple of workshops here and I think the North star metric is a way that you can identify, and it doesn't have to be this like one golden metric, but it's a way to identify a number of inputs that go in that if this number goes up or down, depending on what you need, that it's representative that things are working and that different things are taking place. And as I mentioned, for our company, it's really difficult to figure out a North Star metric for insights. So for example, in a perfect world, I would love it if every Amplitude customer uh, would be obligated to click a button that we would add to our product every time they learn something really insightful and log it, and then be forced to go back and see a list of all of the things they learned and have to follow up with it and then put into our product how much money that saved them or made them, like that would be wonderful, but no one has time for that. So what we do is we looked at all of our data and we figured out that if people run reports or do what we call queries in our product and they share it with multiple people at the organization, those companies that do that 
tend to tell us that they get the most value from Amplitude and they tend to renew our product on a regular cadence. When we find companies that, you know, for one reason or another, use our product for a couple of years and then stop using it, it's usually they haven't been sharing a lot of these insights within the organization. Usually it was like one person who just was hoarding all that information and then maybe they took a new job. And so then there was no one left of the company that was getting these insights. So we have this metric that we're using as our, our North Star metric. We call it weekly sharing users, which is how often on a weekly basis are things in Amplitude being shared with two or more people. And that's the closest that we've been able to come up to for a proxy for, you know, insights. But um, I wish there was more that we can do. It's just, you know, unfortunately, I don't think that our customers want to take the time to just tell us all the insights they're learning um, because, you know, they got things they have to do in their job. But it would make our lives a lot easier. Okay. Uh, love this. Um, so my perception is um, that the data can also be a bit scary to people because not everyone is like a, a numbers person or um, geeked around in, in early years in, in, in budget planners like you. Um, what skills would you encourage aspiring product managers to learn related to, to the data world? Uh, and yeah, maybe like skills, but also uh, tools or very concrete resources that, that kind of um, help you kind of find an entry and then also keep keep learning yeah a, a couple of things i would think of um first of all it never hurts to know sql sql is like the lowest common denominator luckily people who use products like ours don't have to know sql because we do all that for you and you don't have to worry about that but i do think that just having a foundation in sql i have a couple kids who are in college right now and i force them to take classes to learn sql because i do think it helps you just to understand data and the relationships between data I think it's becoming increasingly important to understand how cloud data warehouses work. Um, Snowflake, Databricks, GCP, all of these are becoming really prevalent in our industry. So understanding how to get data from one place to another place is a really useful skill. Um, I think this may sound weird, but I actually think presentation skills is what I see is lacking the most. And I've told my kids that in college, I want them to take a class in which they have to learn how to get up in front of 10, 20 people and make an argument and be able to present data because turning data into a way to convince stakeholders or executives of making change based on the data is something that is really hard. And I think both marketers and product teams are, um, I don't want to, generalized, but I would say more often than not, they're the type of people that would say, here's the data. Of course, we should do this. But they don't really realize that they have to sell it and they have to sell why they should make a change. And they just think it's obvious, like, look at the data, like we have to do this. But executives um, may not be sold on that. And they have to be, you got to make it look good. And you've got to tell a compelling story. That's one of the reasons why I wanted us to add session replay to our product, because I've had experiences where I've had data that says, hey, we have a big problem between checkout and purchase. And we need to invest a million dollars to improve the process between there. And executives are like, no, I'm not spending that money. But then you show them, a bunch of recordings of people not being able to get from checkout to purchase because of some crazy stuff that you have. And suddenly they're like, this is awful. Why are we doing this? We need to fix this. I'm like, that's the same thing I just asked you for. And you said no, but now you see it and now you want to make the change. So I think that learning how to communicate data in a story is, is a really lost art. And I think it's becoming harder and harder as we all live behind Zoom. Um, I think you've got to learn how to do it in person and be able to look people in the eye. And that's why like, I love giving presentations like the one that you, know, you and I met in Berlin, because it forces you to have to tell a story and have to like win people over to your point of view. And oftentimes data is just a small part of that. It's like 25% of the effort. 
Okay. Okay. Excellent answer. I really love that. Um, there's a question from a, one of the people in the audience uh, from Craig. Um, if you bring that uh, question uh, on the stage. Um, so with so many different data points that your business can look at and analyze, how from a product perspective, how do you prioritize what data should be your focus? Do you do you do decide based on business objectives, uh, for example, reducing churn, increasing number of customers, et cetera? Yeah. Thanks for the question, is, Craig. Um, yeah, this is it's a good, great question. And I think it's different in every business. But, you know, I would say that if you're and that's where I lean on this North Star metric, because I would say, what are the things that are going to have the most impact on that North Star metric? But, for example, right now we're in this weird economy where preventing churn is a really big problem because not many people are spending as much and it's about keeping your customers. So that may shift your company to say, we want to focus on data around churn. So like I can tell you, like at Amplitude right now, um, we have never put more of a focus on looking at which of our customers are fully taking advantage of our product and which ones are not, because we want to make sure that during the tough economic climate, that when their contract renewal comes up, that we have really good information about how they're using our product, who's using our product, what would be the negative downsides if they stopped using our product. But if you're in more of an economic boom, you might want to look at data like more around revenue and finding and acquiring new customers because right now a lot of people have their checkbooks open. So I think it depends on the economic climate, but ultimately I would just go back to whatever your North Star metric is, figure out what are the sub metrics underneath that and see what you can impact. And um, there's actually a, a cool new product I just saw recently that uh, that is worth checking out. Um, if you haven't seen a product called Double Loop, that is a really cool product that basically helps you kind of take your North Star metric and then break it down into sub metrics and then actually allows you to import data and show the, the relationship between your sub metrics and your North Star metric. And it's a really cool little product that uh, that a product person uh, who I know has just started to build and that they have like, you know, they're just kind of in beta, but it's a really cool idea. Um, and I think that would help with Craig's question of being able to say, I want to see which of these metrics and submetrics are having the most impact on my ultimate North Star metric. Great. So Airfocus is in the business of uh, product management and while data um, is, a, is a big component of product management, um, very often product managers are kind of faced with um, a backlog or roadmap um, uh, and a list of items ultimately um, where you have no data because it's something new that you're putting into the world, right? So um, how can data help APM or product team um, in kind of shaping the roadmap and, and, and making the right decisions when there's when you're literally solving a new problem, there's no data um, that kit can really help you. Yeah, that, that's definitely tricky. Um, this is something we're wrestling with right now because um, there's always a long backlog of features that, that people want. I think I can just tell you the way we're working through this right now at Amplitude is um, we interact with a lot of customers. We have two cycles. We have a PLG cycle and then we have an enterprise sales cycle. Um, on the PLG front, we are working feverishly to make it easier for people to buy and onboard our product without talking to a human. So we recently just launched where you could literally swipe a credit card and just start using our product. So we had uh, we were able to quantify how many people who we want to go through our PLG motion were struggling because they got to a certain point where then they had to talk to someone in order to figure out the right price and set up invoicing and paying. And so what we were able to do is quantify, here's our flow and here's where we're losing people and here's the percentage. And if we could remove the friction here, this, we believe, we extrapolated out how much money we think we would make. And we've already made millions of dollars by just letting people self-serve. And so that kind of proved that out. On the enterprise side, the hardest part is, uh, like you said, you don't have any data behind these features. So the, what we're doing 
is we have a spreadsheet that we've created where we have a list of a lot of the really big features that we want to add to the product, but it's also really expensive to add to the product because they're pretty involved features. And what we've asked our sales team to do is to identify every prospect who we're speaking to that brings up features that they really want that are really important to them. And what we're doing is we're basically checking off on a spreadsheet, all of these different features, and then identifying what would be the potential value of that customer. Is that a, a $500,000 customer, a million dollar customer? And what that's helping us do is go back to the product team with a financial lens that says, hey, I know we can't do all of these, but right now these are the ones being asked the most. And here's how much money we might be losing if we don't have these features. And it allows us to compare features on a financial lens. Now, you don't always want to take the financial lens because you want to build the best product possible. And like I said earlier, sometimes there's things that we just come up with an idea and it turns out to be really popular. But especially in a tough economy, uh, that's what we're starting to do. And our product team really appreciates that they know that if they build a feature that there's already a uh, a wallet of money that they can point to that adding that feature is would be paid for because we have customers who've already asked for it. So that's that's what we're working through right now. But, you know, I don't know if you've had a different approach at Air Focus. Uh, no, we're doing something different, uh, of course. And I think another um, data point, um, whereas it's like different data, it's not the analytics that that you're doing is we are, we were big fans of making sure all the customer feedback all the ideas all the requests all the uh information that you have on a, on, on a given subject is centralized in in one place and that you kind of make the connections between all these individual um information data points to the the feature that you have in your backlog or uh, on your roadmap um so that you can literally count um what, what people wanted and so that you can see the the context also behind all these different requests we we think this already is a is a big game changer and it's also like working with data i would say but it's uh, it's obviously different than tracking vows and mouse and and all that stuff that, that you're doing yeah. um that is super helpful for making decisions on, on on features or products that you already have um we have another question from uh, one of the people in the audience philip I'm super curious about this question. When to use dirty Excel and Google Analytics and when to start using more dedicated software for analyzing data, such as Amplitude, I assume. Adam. Yeah, um, I mean, I am a big Excel fan. I think the, the problem with spreadsheets is that you can't ask that second, third, fourth level question and you can't do things like looking at path flows or journeys or conversion funnels where you want to hold certain properties constant. I think Excel is obviously great for just looking at, you know, basic reports of totals and so on. But I think that there's a big difference um, between spreadsheets. And I would also love BI tools in that as well. Like we love Tableau, Looker, Power BI, but they serve a completely different purpose than what I think about as digital analytics or product analytics, where you're doing deep dives into the data and you're trying to build cohorts of users that did this, but didn't do that so that you can then either show them something different, market to them, feature flag them. So I think there's just a whole different world and they're very complementary. Um, and again, Google Analytics is fine if you just need a free tool. Uh, we have a free version of Amplitude and our product does way more, including you know things we've talked about, marketing plus product analytics, plus session replay, plus feature flagging. All of those things are things that uh, you can't do really in Google Analytics. Unfortunately, they got rid of their optimized tool. Um, but I think that starting with a free tool, if you have a small product is great. But I would definitely err on starting with a product analytics tool versus a marketing analytics tool.
because product teams using Google Analytics to try to do product analytics, I've just never seen it end very well. And just because GA4 is an event-based model doesn't necessarily mean it's a product analytics tool because it doesn't have all of the deep features that companies like ours have built into our product over the last 10 years. So um, both of them are free, both of them, even the paid version of Amplitude and GA are basically the same. So you just get so much more with a product that does both marketing and product analytics, but that's as much of a commercial as I'll give you. <laughs> Great. So this wouldn't be a, a webinar in 2024 if we wouldn't talk about the future and what AI means for the future. But before we get there, um, anything, uh, Adam, is there anything that you think um, we didn't ask yet in terms of um, data uh, with product teams, um, maybe misconceptions, um, typical things you see, pragmatic advice, something that we didn't cover yet. Yeah, I think one thing I would throw in is one of the most overlooked part of data and analytics is data quality and data governance. And I think it tends to be an afterthought for a lot of companies, but you have to really make sure that the data that you're collecting is accurate. And there's certain analytics tools out there where you could just send data in and it could have the wrong formatting, like it could be a postcode field, but it actually isn't a postcode. And you can't check that when it comes in, you can't quarantine it. And once the data is in, you can't take it out. So I think really understanding that when you ask a product team to make critical decisions based on data, you should not do that unless you are willing to put your name and almost your whole career on the line that this data is accurate. Because if they make decisions on data that turns out to be faulty, then you're going to be the one to blame. And I've seen this happen in a number of organizations where they, they get burned, a product teams will get burned a couple times. And then by the third time, they're, they're like, I'm out. I'm not trusting this data. And too few companies focus on that. That's why our company, we acquired a whole company called Iteratively that just focused on data quality and data governance because we wanted to make sure that whatever data gets into our product is accurate. Or if data gets in and it's not accurate, it's very easy to find and clean up. And this will segue into your AI topic because we actually started using generative AI to evaluate the data coming in and flag situations where we think the data may not be accurate or may not be matching the tracking plan that you had set out. And so we give you an AI driven score that says, here's your data governance score, and you can check it and be alerted if you're not at hundred percent. And we'll tell you why and give you ways that you can fix it. But I can't underscore how important data quality is because everything we've been talking about in this hour is useless if no one trusts the data. And it's one of those things that people do after the fact, and it needs to be built into the process from the get-go to make sure that every time you're launching a feature and you're collecting data, that someone is validating that. And then periodically making sure that after the feature is launched, make sure checking back that the data is still accurate because as you make changes to your apps or websites, you know, things change, CSS files change, DOMs change. You want to make sure that the data doesn't get wrong. And that's why it's like some analytics tools in the market uh, that product teams use, use this concept of auto tracking, where it just tracks everything. And we find that that ends up being like a data governance nightmare and people end up just not trusting anything because of the data keeps changing every time they change the app. We're much more fans of more of a prescriptive approach where you're consciously making sure the data you're, you're collecting is right and accurate. But that's one thing that I see trip up a lot of companies is data quality. Yeah, it's such a such an important point, and I also think it's the reason why um, I see so many product teams and product people that are a bit burned uh, by with this whole topic. They they ha had bad experiences, and I think that's also re reflected in the polls uh, that we saw on our LinkedIn and and early on. And so, in terms of very pragmatic advice, let's say you're a product manager or even a product leader in a in an organization that is kind of burned where, where you have these bad experiences and nobody really has a data-driven mindset or trusts the data. Um, what's a good pragmatic starting point um, to fix this? Is it pulling in an outside consultant? Is it um, sending people to like some conference or <laughs> a lengthy um, reforge uh, training session? What, what, what do you do in a pragmatic way? 
Yeah, no, I don't think it's actually that difficult. I think what it is, is when you have a work plan, depending on how you work, I mean, some people use agile, but basically make sure that there's always a part of that process for the validation and QA of the data related to the new thing that's being released. And then a regular follow-up cadence that doesn't take very long, that just says, hey, once a month, we're going to have someone go through a checklist and we're going to look at this you know, feature and make sure that this event is collecting. There are certain properties associated that make sure those are set up. Now, if you're using an advanced tool, like I like to think of ours as an advanced analytics tool, you could actually build alerts into it to say, show me if this data, the events ever skew outside of a, a standard deviation. That might give you a clue that something's up. We can highlight data anomalies within properties, and we can set up regex rules where you could say, here is what I'm looking for in this property. If you ever see something that doesn't match these rules, then I want you to quarantine it until I check it out and make sure it's good, and then I can approve it. And since everything is timestamped these days, it doesn't matter, and you can just approve it later, and then it'll fall into the right sequence. So a little bit can be solved with technology. A little bit is process. But at the end of the day, I think companies miss out on using both of these tools. And what happens is they launch on day one and the data is working and then they forget to check back and then it ends up getting messed up. So usually it's not a problem from day one. It's usually a problem of maintenance more than someone forgetting to do it in the beginning. OK, I would like to go even a bit deeper. So let's say you're um, a company that is not just struggling with data quality, but in general with a data-driven mindset. So let's say you're almost like willing to throw everything aboard that you have and, and start from scratch, but, but, but you're kind of aware that something needs to change in the team and in the, in the DNA of the, of the team or the company. Um, where do you start? Um, do you empower or enable or, or, or train the people that you have, or do you pull in someone from the outside to, to help you with that like difficult phase? Yeah, I think the, the thing you have to do is it could be hiring new people or bringing in an outside person. But I think the key is you've got to decide as an, or a product team, where do you stand on data? And like I said, you might be on the 37 signals approach that says, nope, you know, we're not, we will use it in a different way than other folks. I think you need to figure out where you are on that spectrum and then get everyone on board with that. And if you need someone from the outside to help you, to do that, that's fine. We found that going through like a North Star workshop can do wonders for getting people to like realize, yeah, we really should think about this more. And I think that you have to figure out a, a mindset that is in line with the culture of your team and your company. Because if you're very, if you want a very data driven mindset, but you're, you have a very creative product team, like that may not be a recipe for success. So, you know, I think Apple is a, a perfect example where like, um, I would imagine that Steve Jobs was probably not, like he was probably more on the 37 signals approach. And, um, you know, I think that there's other products. I think if you're all, it also depends on your life cycle of the product. I think if you have a very mature product, you know, you might already have lots of data on it and it's not going to change that much. But I think in the beginning of a brand new product, I think you need to be a little more flexible because you may not have product market fit yet. You may not even know what you're really building and you may not know what your, what your metrics should be. But I think you should use data here and there just to kind of as a guidepost. So I think the, the, more, ex the more experience and the further along a product comes, I think you're probably going to be a little more rigid when it comes to data, and it should probably be a little more free-flowing in the early days. Um, but that's just my opinion. And again, I haven't started my own company, so you might have different opinions. No, this was a great answer. So let's come to our very last question, um, the AI question. So. Looking at the future, how do you predict the, the integration of machine learning and AI? Um, how will this alter the, the landscape of data usage and product management or just uh, analytics in general? I think most categories um, will be heavily, will heavily look different in, in five years, uh, like most tools. Um, it's, just, it's gonna be the same for Air Focus. And, we will all look back um, and say, hey, remember when we did this uh, five years ago? And then we will like smile and, and and laugh and it will be kind of this, this weird moment. 
and, and I, I would assume it's it's going to be the same with uh, working with data and and yeah. analytics. So so show us the future. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a crystal ball. I'd have a lot more money, but I'll tell you my my what my gut tells me and what we're seeing. So um, right now, we we're seeing a lot of organizations who are saying, "I build reports, I build dashboards, I build conversion funnels with the goal of identifying some insights." Why do I have to do that in a world of AI? Can't AI take the question that I'm interested in and do the heavy lifting of figuring out the right report, building the report, summarizing the report and saying, this is what I think is going on here. And then you just dive deeper if you need to. And that's what that's what we're seeing so far people ask for and that's what we built into amplitude so you can go into like our product right now and just like type a sentence and we'll automatically figure out the right report for you create it let you save it and then analyze it for you i think that ai will never take the place of communicating the impact of data like we were talking about earlier getting in front of a group of people and presenting it and telling a story It'll give you a, a page long about it, but I don't know if it will effectively like sell someone on why they should make a change. So I think there'll always be a place for humans. So I think one is just the mechanics of getting you to insights faster is where I think AI is going to really help in the data world. But on the other hand, I think we just talked about data quality. I think AI is going to do wonders for identifying situations where the data may not be looking consistent and either highlighting this is like, hey, you've got a huge opportunity here because something you didn't realize was happening or your data is really screwed up here. You need to fix this. So I think no one, no human has the time to open up every single event and every single property in an analytics product like that would take hours and see if there's anything funny going on. But computers don't sleep. They don't take breaks. They can do that all day long and just be surfacing these these insights or or anomalies for you so i think that's going to be a really huge impact and then third and this is really cool one of our co-founders painted this vision and i don't know if it'll happen if it is it'll be really cool but what he talked about at one of our internal meetings was this idea of a self-correcting or self-improving product and the idea would be that someone is using let's say someone's using air focus and you have a couple things that you'd like to try out and suddenly it automatically like the product automatically puts uh, a bunch of people into an ab test with a new feature and then it sees how that feature is working and without you doing anything if it's working it just rolls that feature out and then it's always trying different things um, and it's always improving the product and you're just kind of watching and you can like pull the brakes if you ever want but I think this is a vision that we have where people could be using a product like Amplitudes to basically um, fit, tell the AI what is the North Star metric, what are the things we want people to do, and let the AI keep changing. Maybe it moves a feature from the left to the right side. Maybe it moves it down to the bottom. Maybe it hides things from the nav as a test. And if it works, it just keeps doing that for more and more people. And suddenly you wake up the next day and your product looks totally different, but it's actually performing much better. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that is a potential scenario where a lot of the stuff that we're doing today, where it might take to go from, hey, we have an idea of a new feature to prototyping it, to launching it, and then making it in production, like that could take weeks or months now. What if that happened like in seconds? So that could be really cool, but I think there's also some potential downsides there. But I don't know. That, that's one. Those are the three areas that, that I've thought about AI. Thanks so much. This has been super inspiring. And um, thank you so much, Adam, for, for sharing all these insights. Um, super interesting stuff. Um, uh, I think this is going to be a piece that um, people will revisit from time to time because there are so many actionable insights in it. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, um, of course, of course. Um, we should do this again. Um, yeah, so um, the, the, there was this uh, Q&A on my LinkedIn, and I, I would like to um, 
the audience to revisit this Q&A and, um, and kind of help us better understand what's, what's going on around this whole topic uh, so we can uh, all learn and um, get better at uh, data analytics. Um, yeah, so I would like uh, towards the end of this, this webinar now move to um, the upcoming webinars that we have as part of this uh, series. So um, very soon we're going to talk uh, about customer delight and innovation with uh, Todd Lombardo and Ramley John. I'm very excited about this. Then we are going to have Tim Herbig, uh, the German uh, product guy from Erfurt. We're going to have him on uh, talking about how to get from product strategy to quarterly OKRs. Also uh, very excited about this. This is going to be happen on April 10th. And then next, we're going to have a, a panel um, about product ops, a very hot topic of the year. So we're going to have like Stephanie Liu, uh, Chris Butler, Antonio Landi, and Diana on, and this is going to happen um, in, in the middle of April. Um, and then, of course, Roman Pichler, um, the mastermind of product strategy. He's going to talk about uh, product roadmaps, and this is going to happen in the beginning of May. So um, please all um, check out uh, our homepage uh, and check out our, our upcoming events um, and make sure to sign up because there's going to be uh, a lot of um, learnings and insights in that, um, uh, hopefully as valuable as the, the stuff that we learned today from Adam. Thank you so much and tune in Thanks again everyone. soon. Thanks for having me. Bye. Take care, everyone.